Thank you, Jess, and good morning to you all. And I, I guess as the business uh, component of this mix, I'm, uh, I'm the thorn between the two roses here. But uh, that's okay because the actual reality of the situation is that if we are to arrive at a more sustainable place in life, that it won't be art or science that actually leads us there. It has to be business. Um, that has to be the case. But here we are in the middle of 2011 and the whole debate around the environment and business is just mired in this mix of speculation, vested interest, disinformation, misinformation, falsehoods, political point scoring, and so on. And that's, uh, that's on a good day, isn't it? So in the face of all that, what I thought I'd do is retreat um, and retreat into fact into experience, into knowledge, and into reality. And my proposition this morning is actually quite simple, and that is, if it exists, it must be possible. So I'm going to try and paint a picture of what a sustainable business might look like by telling you about what my company, Interface, has been doing, learning, um, trying, stumbling over, over the past 16 years, and in so doing, try to imagine what business could look like in 20 years' time, if not before. I've been now with the company for 20 years, and for the past 16 of those years, we've been trying to, re to reinvent ourselves by trying to create a sustainable business model, a better way to a bigger profit, as we define it. Our mission zero that is up on the screen here. Let me start off by telling you a bit more about who and what we are. And we are, in fact, um, a company that comes from the first wave that we saw from James before. What was the first industry that, that you saw up there? Textiles. We are from that first wave. Um, we're global. We are a U.S. company. We are listed on the NASDAQ exchange, which means we have all of those short-term Wall Street-type drivers that give you a short-term focus if you're not so careful. We are a design-based company, and uh, we're involved in the commercial interiors market, and our core business is making modular carpet that we sell into offices, schools, hospitals, hotels, and so on. We're about 40 years old. We have sales of around a billion dollars, so we're kind of a smallish global multinational company. We make products on four continents, including Australia. We've been here for about 40 years. Um, we are design-based, but we have a fairly significant environmental footprint in the sense that we have been petrochemical intensive. Most of our, our, um, our materials uh, come from oil-based sources, or, or certainly have been, and we use those to run our factories. And as, as I just said, we are a very old industry. We come from that first wave. And for the first 25 years or so of our existence, we didn't think a huge amount about that environmental impact other than the need to comply with local regulation. But that changed about 16 years ago with this realisation that someday people like me would end up in jail. And that was an awakening that our founder and chairman, Ray Anderson, had. Um, and Ray was reading a book in 1994 entitled The Ecology of Commerce by an author called Paul Hawken. And Hawkins' book outlined the degree to which nature systems were in a state of decline and the degree to which business was at the heart of the problem. And for Ray, it branded Interface as a plunderer of the earth. And it helped Ray to understand that, that the way that we did business was fundamentally out of step with nature and therefore ultimately working against itself. So Ray, Ray had what he called his, um, his spear in the chess moment, um, his, his midlife correction at the age of 62, and from that point on, led a change within the business. And it's a change based on three fundamental beliefs. We all have the shot of the globe in our presentations, I'm sure. Belief number one, as we heard from James, is that fundamentally the world doesn't have the carrying capacity to support the way that we consume and produce. Um, you can be a, a climate change sceptic and understand the logic of that, we think. Secondly, um, the concept that the Industrial Revolution of the 1700s, which still um, is the business model that most of us use today, is again fundamentally out of step with nature and working against it. And it was a method 
that was established um, when resources were absolutely plentiful and labour was cheap. And ever since then, we've been completely driven by the need to increase labour productivity. Now, of course, we're in, in the reverse situation with approaching 7 billion people on the planet. Labour um, is absolutely plentiful and our resources are being depleted. The third belief is that business is at the heart of the problem, in fact created it, and therefore it's accountable to fix it um, and move on. So what did we do? Well, we, um, back in 1996, created a vision for a sustainable company in all of its uh, dimensions. And we, we talked about product, we talked about processes, talked about the planet, um, talked about people, and talked about profitability. And lo and behold, that was our 5P model. And that came to be called Mission Zero, as we saw earlier. And it's a journey that's based on three areas of focus. The first one um, being a need to reduce our environmental footprint in all ways. A second one to close the loop on the product. And, and this one for us is really important as a materials intensive business. As we heard from James, um, waste is something that does not appear in nature. It's um, it's a wonderfully cyclical system um, where, the, where the waste from one process is the food from the next. What happens in 99 companies out of 100 is that we dig up stuff from the Earth's crust, we convert it into product, it has a life. At the end of the life, it ends up in landfill, so which is extremely linear. We call it a take-make-waste model, um, and that's wrong. So our aim is to completely close the loop so that our material inputs are ultimately the waste from the last cycle. The third initiative is really around trying to build a culture to make those first two things happen. So let me just go through a couple of initiatives that we have um, put in place over time. Um, we've got the waste shot as well. Um, the first um, thing that we said that we had to do was to try to eliminate waste. Um, it's okay to use the waste that's, that's there now, but if we continue to generate waste, uh, that's going to get us nowhere. So for us, the most, the most important thing is to define what waste is. And in our case, it isn't just end-of-line scrap. It's all those things that don't add value for the customer that the customer would not readily pay for. So if you send a delivery of carpet to the wrong address, for example, that's a waste, and it's not something that the customer is going to see any value in, therefore they won't pay for it. So um, if we get to the end of the year, haven't sold a whole lot of stock, we have to write that off, that's a waste that the customer wouldn't ordinarily pay for. So anything of that, of that nature, we're committed to reduce by 10% every year on every site in every country around the world. And over time, that has yielded us savings of $480 million, um, which has boosted profitability significantly and funded a lot of the other things that we needed to do to uh, walk towards Mission Zero. The second thing, and you know, just imagine we were back in 1995, um, here was this hard-assed, serial American entrepreneur who suddenly turned 180 degrees um, and gone all warm and fuzzy, we're all trying to scramble around to sort of figure out how to keep up, um, what to do, where to start. What is the first step that you take? So one of our bright engineers decided, well, what would happen simply if we decided that for our next range of carpet, we'll make it with 4% less yarn, less fibre than we normally do? What, what, what would the impact of that be? So they went down that path, they designed the product, it looked fantastic, it uh, performed in the right way, so there were no sort of compromises there. And then they went back upstream to our supply chain, right back up to our supply chain to attempt to understand what the impact of that would be. And they were amazed to discover that if you look at the energy savings back upstream across the whole supply chain, by using 4% less yarn in the next range of products, it equated to the amount of energy it took to run our own factories for two years, which was an incredible discovery as to the power of the customer and the ability we all have to make decisions that can create change upstream. Really important lesson for us. 
we are in Australia and in the US and in many other countries a carbon neutral manufacturer and you don't see too many of those and one of the things that, that, you, that you need to do there is to take ownership of the whole supply chain. So if I'm making carpet, my carbon footprint um, that um, occurs uh, within our four walls is only about 15% of the impact of the whole life cycle of the product. 70% um, of it occurs before our materials get to us and the rest of it occurs after it leaves the factory. So we could take the approach that we only account for 15% of the problem, therefore it's up to the other guys to, to sort that out. Or you could say, because I make the choices and decisions around the product, I own the impact across the whole life cycle. And that's the only approach that you can take. Finally, uh, as an example um, of biomimicry, and we, we are slaves to this, to this concept, and we've um, implemented a whole range of, of, of initiatives um, using the lessons we can learn from nature. Um, and I'll just go through a very small one, uh, and it's, it's about how we install carpet. So for hundreds of years, you install carpet by getting a whole bucket of glue sloshing it over the floor and you stick the stuff down like there's no tomorrow. Um, that might sound okay, um, but the issues with that are that glues tend to be fairly nasty stuff and they can emit some pretty horrible emissions, number one. And number two, at the end of the life of the product, trying to get it up off the floor is a nightmare. It sticks and you just can't get it up. So how can you recycle if you can't get it back and you can't get it up? So he said, okay, let's try and address the problem by using some of the, these um, lessons from nature. So after a while, somebody observed the gecko and observed the way in which it, hung, it hangs upside down. So we thought, well, I wonder what would happen if instead of sticking the stuff to the floor, we actually stuck back up towards the carpet. And using that principle, we came up with the tactile, which is kind of a cool name, isn't it? Um, a little disc that has the sticky side up and, and you anchor the each, uh, each of the four or the corners of the carpet tile um, to that disc so that it sort, of, it sort of holds it in place and the weight of the product holds it down um, but there's no sticky underneath. Um, you get no nasty emissions from the glue and at the end of the life of the product um, there's no impact, there's no contact with the floor. You can simply take it up with ease um, and recycle it in the way that you need to. Really simple example of that principle that we heard from James. So, how far have we come? Well, we, we, we think after 16 years, we're about halfway there. So, it ain't a short journey. Um, our energy per unit is down by about half. Our water usage is down by about 80%. Um, our actual greenhouse gas emissions are down by 35%. So, we don't feel too concerned about 5% targets. You know, here, here we are, this petrochemical intensive industry. Um, and our waste to landfill is down by about 80% as well. So how do we do it? Well, we did it, did it through leadership. Um, it's really tough if you don't have that. It's about putting it on the daily agenda, um, making sure that everybody understands the link between the uh, traditional business imperatives and these new set of imperatives. We did it by engaging experts in a whole range of ways. We have uh, an ongoing consultancy arrangement with the person that wrote the book, Biomimicry, bio as an example. We have energy experts that, um, that help us with it. We started off with waste. Um, that, again, is the thing that has helped to fund everything else that we've done. And we've done it by measuring every little environmental impact that we have and holding people accountable for its improvement and linking reward systems to that improvement. We've done it by realizing that you can't do it alone. You know, if you, if you look at nature, no, no individual element in nature sits in isolation. There, it's all part of a wider ecosystem. Every business is part of a wider ecosystem. You need to work with your suppliers, with your customers, with the wider community to find solutions. And importantly, for all those companies, all those people that say, where the heck do I start? It's about small steps. It's about trying to nurture small steps, um, there are very few big bang solutions here. And in many ways, we've had to totally re-engineer um, 
our thinking. And it's amazing how often that is a complete 180 degree flip on what we have done for years. So is there a business case here? Is, is this stuff sending us broke? Well, it's not. Quite the reverse. Um, our costs are lower. We have less waste. We're using less stuff. We have uh, fewer input costs, lower energy costs. All that's great for our cost base. We have much better products. They are designed using nature's principles. They offer much better value for money. We have many more customers. People want to do business with companies that care about the way that they make their money. And probably our most important lesson so far is that we attract and retain some fantastic people in the business. You know, we're a, um, we're a first wave company. We're, we're often regarded as being a part of the sunset industry, which is uh, textiles in Australia. So when you're lining up at Sydney University trying to, in, trying to um, interview candidates um, and you're up against the banks and the IT companies and the design companies, they're not rushing towards a carpet company, frankly, on which to build um, their long-term careers. But we know if we can get ourselves in front of people that we uh, want to recruit and we can tell our story well enough, um, we never fail to get our person and they stay. If you can get this stuff right, there's nothing better um, in terms of the energy levels and commitment that you get amongst your people. So in, in conclusion, let me, um, let me say that the fourth belief that we have come to is the real kicker. Um, when business focuses on its environmental and social impact, as well as financial results, it'll do better in all three dimensions. This triple bottom line thing is not a compromise, it is mutually supportive. A sustainable company is a more profitable company, and it looks a lot like nature. There's no waste. It runs on um, renewable energy. Its processes are cyclical. It celebrates diversity. And it sees itself as part of a wider system. So we're uh, about halfway to mission zero. The last half of our journey certainly won't be easy. It's in front of us. Um, we plan to be there in less than 10 years, if not, uh, not 20. But we know the power of zero. And what's more, it's real and it's achievable. Thank you.